Good morning and a very warm welcome to our Sunday morning service here in Peterhead Congregational Church. We bid you welcome wherever you're joining us for worship this morning and we trust that wherever you may be that the Lord in his grace and in his mercy will reach out to bless you as during this time we seek to lift the name of Jesus Christ high above every name and to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Can I remind you that on Wednesday evening we'll have the, our midweek Bible study at seven o'clock on the YouTube channel and that will be the, the fourth part, the last part of the book of Jonah and we'll move on after that to look at the um, Old Testament prophecies of the birth of the Saviour. The psalmist writes, Find rest, O my soul, in God alone, for my hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God, for he is my mighty rock and my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him. For God is our refuge and our strength. Let's worship God together and sing to his praise and glory our first hymn. Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace and the words will be on your screen.
Shall we pray together? God our Father, as we indeed come into your peace and your rest this day, we pray that you will bring calmness and stillness to the whole of our being. Take away from us now as we come to worship you all our concerns about the things of this world. Instead, in this hour, help us to put our hope and our trust in you. In these days, Lord, where there's so many things to, to take our mind away, when there's so much news about the, the, the continued increase in coronavirus, we need today to focus our attention on you. For you have bid us join together this morning. You've bid us come to, to sing and praise and read and share and worship you. So help us to do that. Help us to come and to focus our attention on your word today so that we might be built up in faith and hope and trust in accordance with your will. So as we come, give us a desire to, to read and to learn from your word and give us a desire to share that word wherever we go. Now as we come before you, Father, we come as individuals. We come with all our faults and our failings, with our sins that, that remain within us. And so we come, Lord God, asking for your forgiveness of our sins. Your word teaches us that we need to repent of our sins so that forgiveness might indeed cleanse us afresh. So, Lord, we seek to repent of our sins now by confessing them before you. We confess that we have sinned against you in so many different ways in our actions, through our words, through our inaction, through the times when we've been silent and we should have spoken, through our deeds, Lord, through our speech. So as we humble ourselves before you this day, Father, we pray that you would indeed lead each one of us into repentance. Help us to turn away from all these things that seek to separate us from you and help us to turn afresh to see the, the face of Jesus Christ ever before us, to see the path that you would have us tread winding before us, to know your presence and your love and your grace at work within us. And this day, may we know the richness and the fullness of your forgiving love, cleansing each one of us and restoring us in your sight. Lord God, we thank you for the might and the power of your word. For this word given to us that we might share it to the saving of souls. Help each and every one of us have to have the courage and the ability to share it. To have the courage to speak out about you and to be able simply to give an account of the hope that lies within us and thus witness to the truth of your work in our lives. Now, Lord, we would ask that you would continue with us in this time today. We pray that you would be in all that we would do and all that we would say, that the all we do and say might be to your glory and for your sake. For we would ask all of this in and through the precious name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who taught us to pray together as one family 
and to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We would sing again in our second hymn, the words on your screen, a well-known hymn that I'm sure we could all sing even without words. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. Turn now to God's Word, and our scripture reading this morning is taken from the New Testament, from the Gospel according to Matthew, Matthew chapter 8, and reading from verse 1. The Gospel according to Matthew, Matthew chapter 8, and reading from verse 1. Hear the Word of God. When he, that is Jesus, came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand 
and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately he was cured of his leprosy. When Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it will be done. And as you believed, it would. And his servant was healed at that very hour. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and began to wait on him. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, Follow me. And let the dead bury their own dead. Then he got into the boat. And his disciples followed him. Without warming a, fu a furious storm came up on the lake. <clears throat> so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord save us. We're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Amen. And may the Lord add his blessing to this reading of his word. And to his name be all glory and praise. As we come now to our prayers of intercession, um, we, we are mindful of those who are unwell. We're mindful of those that maybe we don't know, but who, who will need our prayers today. And, and we're, we're mindful of all these families who continue to be affected by the, the coronavirus, as the number of, of deaths has increased significantly this week. 
We, we remember that, that this illness is still here, and, and I'm sure we've all read and heard of um, the, the illness in various places around our own time here. This is not a time to slacken off what we do. Instead, it's a time to be cautious and careful. And if we seek to, to be cautious and careful and seek to remain in Christ, then surely we trust that the Lord will see to our needs and indeed the needs of all in his will. Shall we pray together? God our Father, we would remember firstly today those individuals who continue to need our prayers. And so we pray for, for Rosie and, and Charlie Morrison. We continue to pray that they'll continue to be strengthened and upheld by you. We continue to pray for John Slater at this time. And we pray that you'll bless John and that you'll help and encourage him through this time. We continue to pray for Robert and Carmen Mackey as they um, recover, uh, as, or as Carmen recovers after COVID and Robert after a chest infection. And we pray for all who are in need. And we remember our family, the family that we will have heard of um, that were in the accident on the Fraserborough Road and, and how there were children involved in that. And the mum is, is in an induced coma, Father, and so we pray for her at this time. We pray for, for the, the father himself who, who seems to be doing okay, but still there's, there's much need in that family. The, one of the children has two broken legs and the other one has a damaged neck. Such brokenness in one family. We pray, mighty God, that your grace will meet all their needs and that your healing hand will bless that family today. Bless each and every one of them. Lord, we are mindful of families all over our land who are in need at this time. And we would also remember those who who have been struck down with coronavirus and the fact that it seems more prevalent at this time here in our own community once again reminds us of how vulnerable everyone is. So help us not to be afraid, but to be sensible. Help us indeed to seek to follow the, the rules laid down by our government and help us in every way to seek to obey those rules, for they have consequences on everyone else. We remember those who are waiting for operations, waiting for procedures at hospital that have been delayed for months, and we pray that these will not be delayed anymore. We pray for the, the doctors and nurses working in intensive care units and and in hospital wards, and, and indeed on the front line, going into homes and, and into houses. We remember home carers and the task that they have. We remember those in nursing homes and their carers. So many, many people, Father. And we pray that you would keep them near to you and support them all at this time. Bring your peace to bear upon our hearts and upon our lives, that we may know your love and truth and grace. For those families who have lost loved ones in this last week, for those who are waiting for funerals in the week to come, we pray that you would remain near and close to them. Father, as we hear news this week of the possibility of a vaccine against this illness, we thank you for all the skills that you have placed into the hands of those who's, who's, who are scientists and who have been working on securing a virus. Lord, we pray that this 
will indeed be effective and will allow all of us to come back to some kind of normality in our lives in due course. And we long for the day, Lord, when we can throw open the doors and the gates to this church and that we can worship you fully in spirit and in truth, lifting our voices in praise as we sing of your glory. Lord, we pray for our families and our friends, and we pray that you would bless them at this time. We pray that you will keep them all safe and secure in you. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ in churches and meeting halls all over this town. And we pray, Father, that wherever your word is being sent forth in truth and in authority, that you would take it and bless it to the hearts of all. Mighty God, in the silence now, we would bring our own prayers and petitions to you. Lord, you know all our needs, all our hopes. You know all our sorrows and concerns. You know all our joys and aspirations. We bring them all before you. We thank you for those who work tirelessly to maintain the peace across the whole of this land. We pray for those in, our, in, in Her Majesty's forces. We pray for those in the police. We pray for those who are guarding our coastline, for those in the emergency services. Lord, we commend each and every one to you, and we commend ourselves to you, Father. We ask that you would take us just the way that we are and truly make us into what you would have us be. For we would ask all of this in and through the precious name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Now the hymn before the sermon is on your screen. Have you any room for Jesus, he who bore your load of sin?
Shall we pray together? God our Father, as we turn our thoughts now to your word, help us this day to have room in our hearts for your word. As that hymn that we've just sung reminds us, so many, many things can fill and clutter our lives. Help us to have room for Jesus. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Indeed, that marvellous old hymn that we've, we've just sung, Have You Any Room for Jesus?, posts a, a question to each and every one of us. It asks us that question again and again at the start of, of every, every verse, really. Have we got room for Christ in our lives? And that all-important question runs all the way through the passage that we, we read this morning from Matthew's Gospel. It's important that we have room for Jesus Christ in our lives. You know, if you take your car to the petrol station and you try to fill up the tank, and the tank's already full, but then, and it's full perhaps of the wrong stuff, let's say, how can we fill it up because it's already full? So we need to get rid of the rubbish that's in our lives. You know, if your, if your computer gets too many emails, it stops working. It needs you to clear out the rubbish. We need to clear out the rubbish out of our lives to make and ensure that there's room for Christ in our hearts. Fundamentally, we must have him at the very center of our being to assist us to live our lives as Christians. It's not an option to believe in Jesus when it suits us. For the Christian, it is a requirement to hold fast to him every day of our lives. And that hymn reflects that back to us, asking us, have you any room for Jesus? Now, in many ways, as I said, that same question runs through the passage that we've, we've read here today. And, and today's passage is not one small story as such. It's different, different parts of the gospel being told one after the other. Matthew's gospel seeking to, to teach us about God's love and, and Christ's love towards us and his wisdom and his willingness to reach out to us. So we'll begin with that first section, which is about the man with leprosy. So this, the, we're told that Jesus came down from the mountainside and the large crowds followed him and a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Before we go any further, what do we see in that? Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Here's a man who's had this dreaded disease. This leprosy, as we'll know from our own readings of of the scriptures. Leprosy was such a curse. People were so terrified of it. It was a disease that could spread. It was a disease that, that could be caught by anyone in, in any situation. And it ate away at their flesh and eventually paralyzed and killed people. And so it was a, a, a terrible illness and a cruel illness. And to make things worse, because folk were so terrified of it, they were cast out of normal, a normal household. You could not keep, you would not be allowed to keep someone with leprosy at home. They would be taken outside the walls of the city or the village or the town, and they would be completely separate from folk. 
And as the Bible tells us, they would cry out where they came near, unclean, unclean, so that people would stay away from them. It was an existence and not a life. Yet, here's this man, here's this man who has this illness and who comes and speaks and kneels before Jesus. That implies, the text implies that the man came right to where Jesus was. He knelt before Jesus. And, and you know, other folk would have wanted him six feet away, a wee bit like what we've to do with each other these days, keeping everybody two meters apart wherever we're going. We had to be at a distance from everyone. That was just how it was. But the man came up to Jesus and he knelt before him in front of him and he said those words, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. What does that tell us about that man? That in spite of all his difficulties, in spite of his ailments, his trouble, his illness, his faith in God was absolutely secure. And he saw Christ as the Messiah of God. He saw him as the Christ, the one who was sent according to to the scriptures. Why do we know that? Because he came seeking healing from him. He called him Lord. You see, the text doesn't hide anything from us. We only need to open our eyes and read exactly what's there, and it's revealed to us. Lord, he says. He calls him Lord. If you are willing, notice I don't, I want, he's not coming saying, give me, give me, give me. He says, if you are willing, speaking when, in a quiet and a gracious way, you can make me clean. The man says to Jesus, I know that you can make me clean. Absolute faith and trust this man has. I wonder what the crowd thought that were following Jesus when Jesus stood and spoke with this leper. I wonder what they thought. They would be holding back. They would be afraid to come any nearer. And then Jesus did something which on the face of it may seem just a little thing. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. He reached out his hand and he touched the man who had leprosy. We don't know how long this man's had leprosy, but we know one thing. No one, no one will have since the moment that he was told that he had it, no one will ever have reached out their hand to touch him. No matter what kind of state or what kind of place he might have been in, no one would have reached out to touch him. But Jesus Christ reached out. You see, he was untouchable by the world, but he was not untouchable by Jesus Christ. There are folk, modern day lepers will say, there are folk walking the streets of, of, of our towns and cities and villages of this land and of lands all over this earth who are, are far away from God today because they think that God can do nothing for them. Because perhaps their lives have been filled with other things. Because perhaps they've... they've, they've um, been addicted to certain things or whatever that has taken them down a road and maybe even have been cast out from their family. But Jesus Christ is ever willing to reach his hand out. After all, friends, he reached out and touched your life and mine. Why would he not seek to reach out and touch anyone like this man 
who had faith. Someone who was on the outskirts of, of society, cast out by society, comes with faith, and Jesus Christ meets his needs with those words, I am willing. Be clean. Why would Christ be willing? What would make him willing? But that he could see into the heart, into the depths of the, the man who had leprosy. He could see into the depths of his being. And the man was made whole again. You see, it wasn't just the leprosy that was cured. On that day, he was given a brand new life because he would be able to go back home, to go back into the village, to go and start work and to do all the things that he would want to do. Everything that he would want to do would be restored to him because of the touch of Jesus Christ. New life in Christ was given to this man. And to ensure that everything was done according to the law, Jesus tells him to go, tell no one, and to go to the priest and to, to make the prop be examined there and then to make the proper um, sacrifices as required by the law of Moses so that he could be brought back into society. Cast out on his own, no one ever even reaching out to touch his hand or his arm in any way. And suddenly he's received new life. And what is it that he did to receive that? He asked the Saviour. And the Saviour met his need. Now the, the gospel moves on and tells us about the faith of a centurion. And here's another strange kind of story. A centurion, a Roman soldier, someone who was, uh, we would imagine would be a pagan. Come from Rome with all the, the temples and gods that would be there. This man would have had a, a god for every day of the week. And, and that's exactly how they, they lived and worshipped. And yet, this man comes looking for Jesus. He goes to Capernaum, and it's at verse 5. He goes to Capernaum, and the centurion comes to him, and he asks for help. Lord, he says, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. Now, let's just think about that wee bit for a moment. The man comes and says, the centurion comes and says, my servant is unwell. Now, here's this man who is a man of authority. Later, he would say to Jesus, I tell men to come and they come and go and they go. He's in charge of, 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 a, of a company of soldiers. And who is he concerned about here? About a servant. Not about... Um, someone in his family or, or whatever, about a servant. And you know, think of that. Servants were, were most times slaves and, and as such people would not give much thought about them. But this man did. And not only did this man think about his servant that, that, that he was so ill that he came seeking Jesus Christ, but he also came to ask Jesus, think of the cost of that to him. Because he came in the face of all the folk that were in Capernaum. He would be known as a centurion there. And he came asking Jesus Christ, a Jew. He came asking this Jewish rabbi in the eyes of all who were there, will you heal, will you heal my servant? And Jesus responds, and says, I will go and heal him. And then this really strange conversation takes place where the man says to Jesus, 
that he doesn't expect him to come to his house. He says, the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you under my roof. I don't deserve to have you under my roof. Here's another man of faith. Not in a place that you might expect it, but a man who was outside of, 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 of you know, what we would understand as, as um, following Christ. And, uh, but he sees Jesus Christ as, as, as the Messiah also. Where did this knowledge come from? It can only come from one place. It can only come from God who puts that seed of faith into our hearts so that when we hear the word or when we see the truth, we know it to be true and real and active and alive. And so the centurion here says to Jesus, I'm not worthy, just just say the word and he'll be healed. What kind of faith is that that doesn't even need the man to bring his servant there? And what's the response? Jesus says, he was astonished when he heard this. I tell you the truth, verse 10, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you, that many will come from the east and the west and will take their place at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, here was a man who actually believed. Not someone who was saying the right words and doing the right things and just peddling along nicely, thinking if I do this and I do that and I do the next thing, nobody will notice that maybe my faith, I have no faith or that my faith is weak or that I don't really know what to believe in. And here's this man completely outside who has absolute faith that Jesus Christ can heal his servant where they, where they are speaking and his house is however far away it is. And that if Jesus but says, then the man will be healed. And Jesus says to him, go, it will be done just as, as you believed it would. Exactly as the man believed, so that it was. And the scripture says, the servant was healed at that very hour. No need for Christ to touch, just for him to say another opportunity of someone to have faith in the Savior, someone who had room for Jesus Christ, so much room that Christ filled his heart, just like the man with leprosy, so much room that he was cured. Two of them. And then the passage, verse 14, moves on just to a small a small part which tells us that Jesus comes to Peter's um, house and his mother-in-law is not well and he, he, Jesus sees to her need and she gets up and serves them immediately. Another quiet touch of the Saviour so that he gets up, she gets up and, and, and um, the fever that she had left her, he touched her hand and the fever left her. When evening came, in verse 16, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out their spirits with a word and healed them, healed all the sick. Think of that, Capernaum we're at here. And everyone who came, all who came, all were healed. Whatever their illness, all were healed. Not just where, I say again, just like the leper, not just were their lives, their illness taken away, but their lives were changed because any, any kind of illness was feared. There was little knowledge about illness. 
and any illness that was cute, that you know anyone would have, people would be afraid of. And Christ gives all who came who were ill new life. We don't know how many that was. The scripture simply says, when evening came, many who were demon-possessed came, and the demons were cast out, and they were given a new start through Jesus Christ. And then we move on to that last section that we read. The, or, the, the, or the second last section, the cost of following Jesus. There is a cost to following Jesus Christ. The gospel is sent forth absolutely freely. I was watching a, 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 a video on, on YouTube before I came out and um, I, I, I like to listen to, uh, it's a congregation in Northern Ireland who, who sing lots of sankey hymns and so on and they've got loads and loads of them on the, the, um, the, the YouTube videos. And as uh, you know, there was the, the camera pulled back from the pulpit and as on our wall, as I mentioned last week, above the rose window, it says, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And on the wall above the pulpit in that church, it says, woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. There's a fantastic text for the wall of any church. Woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. You see, friends, we have to be willing to accept the gospel. Instead, some folk don't want to hear it. And what that means is that they'll cover their eyes or their ears. My dad's aunt used to have a wee set of three monkeys in her, in her, her display cabinet that sat in the corner. Hear no evil, see no evil, and speak no evil. And folk can so often put their fingers in their ears or cover their eyes or close their mouths. But we're here to tell the gospel, to tell the truth, so that lives can be changed. It is the truth that has changed the life of the man with leprosy that gave the, the, the wishes of the, of the centurion and saved his servant. It's the truth that is Jesus Christ who, who healed all those folk who came to the door. Here now, we're reminded of the cost. And what is the cost? The cost is for us to put off our old way of life and to put on a new way of life that can only be found in Jesus Christ. To stop sinning, to stop going astray, and to seek to follow Jesus Christ all the days of our lives. Then the crowds were told in verse 18, when the crowds around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side. A teacher of the law came and said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. An emotional hearer. I'll follow you wherever you go. Caught up in the moment. But Christ's not looking for us to be caught up in the moment. He's looking for us to make a commitment and to stand by the commitment that we make. Not to say, yes, Lord, and five minutes later to go away and do whatever we like. That is not following Jesus Christ. The old Sankey hymn says, where he may lead me, I will go. So you see, for you and I, we should be waiting to be led by the Savior so that we can live our lives following him. If we're following Christ, that means that we're walking behind him, as it were. He's leading us on, and we're being called to be followers of Jesus Christ here. Another man comes, and he says to him, um, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury the dead. And, and 
you know, what does that mean? He's, he's speaking about those folk who are spiritually dead, folk who do not want to know, folk who do everything to push Christ away and leave themselves out on the limb. There's room for all. In my father's house, there are many rooms. And there's room for all in the household of Jesus Christ. But there is only one way into that house. And that is through Jesus Christ. Here in this church, we have our main church here and we've our small hall and we have our large hall. There's a vestibule at the front and there's a wee room to the side. There's the gallery upstairs. Out through there, there's the vestry and through here, there's the vestibule into the, 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 main, the halls and there's the kitchen and the other facilities and so on. So we've, we've plenty of room, but actually there's only one way into this church. If you come here as I would come to come in to do anything, there's only one door that you can come in. Because there's only one door that we have a key to get in and out. If that door was locked or barred, then you simply cannot get in. There is only one way into the kingdom of heaven. And that way is through Jesus Christ. Now back for a moment to the man with leprosy, back for a moment to the centurion servant, back for a moment to all those folk that were healed. What did they all have? They came believing that Jesus Christ could change their lives. And he willingly changed all of their lives. Those who were spiritually dead, Christ says, we need to leave them alone and move on. Move on to try and bring others into the family of the living God. In the last section that we read, just a few verses, where Jesus gets into the boat and the disciples followed him and without warning, a great storm gets up and the waves sweep over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. In verse 25, the disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us, we are going to drown. And what was his answer? You of little faith, why are you so afraid? How could anything have gone wrong with them? They were in the company of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. They were with the Saviour who called them to serve him. They just saw and were part of all that we've just read and learned in every way. They were present with him. And here in this passage, he rebukes them. He rebuked the, he rebuked the wind and the waves. And it became completely calm. And his disciples say, verse 27, the men were amazed and asked, what kind of man of this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Think of that. A centurion knew who he was. A man with leprosy knew who he was. Those who, who came seeking healing knew who he was. And what do we learn here in the last part of this? That the disciples who were following Jesus perhaps weren't quite sure exactly who he was. Friends, that could be you and I that would be with the Saviour. You see, what that tells us is that the disciples' faith wasn't always strong. Now we know that. We know that even at the end of Christ's life when he was being taken from the garden and taken to be beaten and tried, they, they all disappeared. They were afraid. They were afraid. What's wrong with them here? They're afraid. We are called not to be afraid. We are called to put our hope and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
who has the power to heal and to renew and to save. And if we walk with him, then we will remain safe and secure in him, even unto eternal life. For that is the message of the gospel through Jesus Christ and him alone we have access by faith into the presence of eternity. Shall we pray together? God our Father, we pray indeed that you would lead us and guide us. Help us, Lord, to know that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. Help us to know your will and your purpose in all of our lives and lead us, walk before us, that we might follow you all the days of our lives, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we would conclude our service this morning by singing our closing hymn, the words on your screen, Praise my soul, the King of Heaven.
And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and upon your homes, upon all whom you love in this place and elsewhere, this day and for evermore.